Sammy and Helen Kagambay is going to be uh, here tonight in our service at 6 o'clock, but at 5 o'clock we're going to have a fellowship opportunity. Everybody can fellowship with one another, and then also with, we've invited our missionary to come in early, and so come on out. We'll give you a hot dog for dinner. That sounds wonderful, right? And so come on out, hot dogs and chips, and uh, we'll have, have that all set aside for you. All right. 1 Corinthians this morning. 1 Corinthians starting with the 13th verse. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, or chapter 16, verse 13. We'll get there. If you've got that, stand up with me for the reading of God's word this morning. Paul says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask for for a blessing on the preaching of your word today as we have read it to this congregation. We pray that you would help us to share in its depth and its practicality of how we are to apply it to our life. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. This morning, this passage of Scripture serves as an exhortation. It is a Scripture that's meant to encourage us and provide direction on how we are to live our lives as believers. The Apostle Paul had just finished correcting many issues at the Church of Corinth. You could go through and label probably at least nine, maybe ten major, major issues within this church. If you think that you've been to a church with a lot of problems, chances are Corinth, the congregation there, had them beat. But most of all, their problems and their issues all dealt with a division that had started in the church. And this idea of a division inside the church of Corinth runs from chapter 1 all the way through. They were, they were debating on who was better because of who baptized them. They were debating on who was better, whether they was Jew or Gentile. They were debating on whether they was better because they had a certain set of spiritual giftings. And this led to all types of issues in the church. And um, they were debating things such as the resurrection, whether it was real or not. And so Paul took the 15 chapters preceding this salutation in chapter 16 to correct these issues and to give them a direction forward. And then in chapter 16, he begins to come in and to give them a final instruction to move forward. And so basically, he takes a second theme that should unify all believers. And that is to do everything to the glory of God. In chapter 10, he will say, Whether you eat or whether you drink, do so unto the glory of God. Do so unto the glory of God. And then again, as he has said here in verse 14 of chapter 16, let all things be done with charity. Let all things be done with charity. And so when we breathe, when we act, when we do anything, there are some ways we're supposed to do them. 
One is to the glory of God. And secondly, one is with charity. And so I'd like to go through this scripture today. And I want you to check yourself in the way that you're serving the Lord. How is your service to the Lord today? We begin in verse 13. We're going to go through here verse by verse this morning. But in verse 13, he, he, he gives them this command. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, and be strong. First off, we're to be watch, watchful in our service unto the Lord. We're to be alert and mindful of what is going on around us. We are to be aware, one, of how the Spirit of God is moving in our congregation and in our communities. Two, we need to be aware of how the world is moving away from God and how they are trying to keep uh, creeping into our houses and into our places of worship. We need to be watchful for these things because the devil will come in and try to destroy the fellowship and unity that God's Spirit brings. He tells them to stand fast in the faith. You need to know your doctrine. You need to know the teaching of God's Word. You need to know not simply what the pastor says or what the uh, Sunday school teacher says or what the doctrine of a particular congregation is with their policies and bylaws. You need to know the teaching of the biblical faith and stand in it. You cannot stand on ground that is not solid. You need to have a solid understanding of God's Word if you are to serve. Then the last two phrases, um, he says, Quit you like men, be strong. And these are all wrapped up into one thought here. Um, to be confident in God. You say, what in the world does it mean to quit you like men? Are men quitters? Well, this is where not only do we have to go back and look at the language, but the language here is to be brave. That's what they mean to quit like men. Be brave like men. Stand up, not only for the faith, but not, don't be afraid in doing so. As the scripture I read in this morning service, or in the, in the opening devotion, is that we need to trust in God, trust in His Word, glory in the Word that God has given us, and not fear what men can do to us. Be brave, and again he says, be strong. This reminds me of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, where he says to be confident in the power and might of the Lord. Be strong in God's provision. God has given us His armor of God. He has given us a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness. He has given us a belt of truth. He has given us shoes of the gospel of peace. He has given us a shield of faith. He has given us the sword of the Spirit where we can go and, and live this life victorious over, over sin and Satan. He says, be confident. God has given you everything, so stand in God's provision. In verse 13, basically. But in verse 14, he begins to move on and says, Let everything you do be done with charity. Let everything you do be done with charity. Many different versions, no doubt, have updated that word. And you're probably already, if you've read Scripture much, you've already translated that word in your mind to love. And that is, that is a good thing to do, to be aware that charity is love. The word that is in the Greek here is agape. You've heard that, no doubt. I've preached on the words of love. But you have to think back to where this scripture is also resonating from, where it is reflecting from. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. You want to know what the biggest difference between a believer and an unbeliever is? It is the position of their heart and mind 
toward God in their actions. It is the position of their heart and mind toward God in their actions. An unbeliever goes throughout this world without any thought of their actions and whether or not they give God glory. The believer, however, has in their mind that if I am eating, I do that to the glory of God. I give Him praise. If I'm drinking my water or my Mountain Dew, I should give Him praise for that. If I am sitting at my workbench, I do so in a way that gives glory to God. If I am bending down and tying my shoes, I give glory to God. I give God glory and do everything in an act of praise and an act of service towards Him. That is the thing. That is, that is an idea that if we believe God is Lord and that He is ever present, then we will do all things to His glory. And that is where many a believer comes short in their service to the Lord, though. Is that many of us are so preoccupied with self and with pleasing other people that we do not wage, uh, gauge every action and thought to whether it brings glory to God. Is this thought that I'm entertaining that I just had passed through my mind right now, does it honor God? Does it bring Him glory? God, if it doesn't bring you glory, cast it out of my mind. God, this behavior that I just did, this reaction that I had to what I seen on the TV or this reaction that I had to a, a, another person, did it bring honor to you? Did it bring glory to your name? And if it didn't, I repent of that action. Most of us, we're not going throughout the day like that. And that really does show how little we think about God. But he says here in this chapter, verse 14, let all things be done with charity. So we do all things to the glory of God, but we are also let all of our things be done with charity, or what we might have put as love. But there's something deeper about it than just a feeling. That's what the world talks about love. It's a feeling. Whatever makes you feel good, do that. Whatever, whatever you, you, uh, makes you happy, feelings. And that is not what this scripture is doing. Don't just do things because it feels good. Don't do things because you are simply moved in your being towards this cause. Don't do this simply because it's out of duty or expected of you. Do this because you want to. Again, the word there is agape. It's different than other loves that the Greeks used that Jesus would have used in his day when he spoke in the Greek language. They had eros love. That's a love that you have between a husband and wife where we get the word erotic. That is a love, of, that is a feeling. Then they would have also used the word uh, philo, which is a brotherly love, a feeling of, of love toward other people that you want to help them. And that's normally how we express love is we, oh, I see a person, they, they need uh, help with something and I feel like I need to move with compassion on them and, and help them. Or, or we have a love where, oh, it's my duty to help my brother who is like me. But that's not the word that Paul used here. He said, let all your things be done with charity or agape. What he is saying here, you need to do everything self-sacrificially. Or you can have that love toward them, that feeling towards somebody, but do it out of free will. You see, when Jesus gave his love, he gave us or his life, he did it with an agape love, a charity. I think that's one reason why I like the King James word here rather than the new translations of love. Love is filled with all these things, but charity. When you give to a charity, when you feel that you are, that you are a person of charity and you give, are you giving? Well, I hope to get something back out of this. Or do you give to charity cheerfully? 
Do you work for God begrudgingly? Do you live a holy life simply because the preacher told you not to do certain things? Do you go to church because your parents made you? Or do you do so out of the free will? I love God and I want to do this on my own. He is not coercing me. He is not forcing me to love Him. I want to serve God and I want to do all these things because I want to. That is charity. That is not being a grudging tither. That is being a cheerful giver. And that applies to more than just giving of our finances, but of our time. Do you do so because you want to or because you feel enormous guilt if you don't? When I come to church, it's not because I have to go. It's because I want to go. I get the privilege to go and I want to. I love it and I don't have to be forced I go because I want to. I want to read my Bible. I want to serve in different areas. I want to do these things myself. And I think it applies to what Paul is going to teach in the rest of our scripture. He says, are you doing things because you want to? Or because you're forced to? Are you doing things because that's your desire or because you were guilted into it? Are you doing things because of your own free will love toward God and towards the church? Or are you doing things because you have some type of false standard that you've set up for yourself? Read on to what he has said here. He says, I beseech you, brethren. He says, I'm wanting you to do this. Ye know the house of Stephanus. And he gives an example. That it is the first fruits of Achaia. Stephanus' house um, and Achaia, first fruits of Achaia, talks about this as family, is the first converts in this town of Achaia. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And no doubt like you, being like-minded like me, your your mind is probably locked on that phrase. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. We come in our society with a very negative view of addiction. And that's rightly so. According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, in 2017, they, they, uh, you can get on the website and find it, 19.7 million American adults aged 12 and older battle a substance use disorder. 12 and up, 19.7 million. Almost 74% of adults suffering from a substance use disorder in 2017 struggled also with an alcohol disorder. That's why we say alcohol and cigarettes and vaping and all these different things are gateway drugs. They lead you into other issues. About 38% of adults in 2017 battled an illicit drug use disorder. Not prescribed drugs, but illegal drugs. That same year, one out of every eight adults struggled with both alcohol and drug use disorders simultaneously at the same time. Drug abuse and addiction cost American society more than $740 billion annually in lost workplace productivity, health care expenses, and crime-related costs. When we hear the word addiction, it is rightfully placed that we see it in a negative light. But there is something that we have got to understand about addiction. It is more than just being an addicted to a substance outside of ourself that we put in our body. Addiction is more than alcohol. Addiction is more than drugs. Jo- Dr. Gerald May, he has, he has lists. It's probably, probably about 100 items. And I just went through the list and put some of these things that we become addicted to that we don't realize we're addicted to. You realize that most people that are addicted to drugs and alcohol aren't aware that they're addicted until it's pointed out. 
And so there's a lot of things that we can be addicted to outside of drug and alcohol. How about we're addicted to anger? Or we're addicted to approval from others? Some of us are addicted to candy. Some of us are addicted to cars. Some of us are addicted to chewing gum. Chocolate. There you go. Some are addicted to competition. You ever know somebody that's competitive and will lose all friends because of a competitive nature? They've got to be on top. Have you ever played Monopoly with somebody or Scrabble with my wife? <laughs> Some people are addicted to computers. Some are addicted to eating, envy, exercise. Some are addicted to fame, fantasies, gambling, golf, gossiping. Some are addicted to guilt. Some are addicted to jealousy. Some are addicted to knowledge, lying, memories, messiness, money, movies, music, performance, pimple popping. That is the disgusting thing. People will spend more time watching people pop pimples or cat videos on YouTube and Facebook than they will spend time in their scripture. Politics. Power, revenge, sex, sleeping, sports, stress, suspiciousness, talking, television, work, and so many other things that garner our addiction. And here's what Gerald May, Dr. Gerald May writes in his book, Addiction and Grace, defines addiction as any compulsive habitual behavior that limits the freedom of human desire. It is caused by the attachment of desire to specific objects attachment that's how he finally defines addiction you are attached to something the word attach comes from the french word attache which means to nail yourself to something or to nail something down and that's really what addiction is, is that you have your free will attached to something else, nailed to something else, and you are no longer able to do anything. You are not able to do things in charity. Your own free will, it is forced on you. But Paul talks about these individuals, the house of Stephanus, the first fruits of Achaia, the first converts of this city, they have addicted themselves to the saints. What does Paul talk here? Is it the same thing as our ideal of addiction? In the Greek, it's not a fancy word. It's just simply tasso. It means to put in order, to station, to place in a certain order, to arrange, to assign a place, to a point, to assign or ordain a thing to one or something else. So some translations will take this word and instead of addiction it says they have ordained themselves or they have appointed themselves. But again the word, the definition of the word means that they have attached themselves or set themselves to the ministry of the saints. And this is what I begin to think. When we are addicted to something and we are attached or as the word literally means to be nailed to something I begin to think of how we are nailed to the wrong things when really we should seek to be nailed to the cross of Christ. And here's my thought with that. When we are addicted to the wrong things, we, we no longer freely give ourselves to them and we are mastered by many things that are of no eternal value. Jesus' desire, though, was for him to die on the cross, and it was by his own free will. When Jesus carried the cross and laid it down, the Bible says that no man had to stretch out his arms, but rather he laid freely upon it. Jesus gave his life of his own free will. And Jesus was also able to... to he had the opportunity to call down uh, uh, thousands of angels and destroy the world and release him. 
But he said no to that and he said yes to us. We have that same calling in our life. Matthew chapter 16 verse 24. Then Jesus said, said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. We are called to go the same way and to attach ourselves to the sufferings of Jesus for this world. But we have the freedom to pick up our cross or not. Another scripture says it that we are to pick up our cross daily. We have the freedom in Christ to follow Him or we have the freedom to attach ourselves to other things and like many other addictions, they grab a hold of us and we become entangled. And so this morning, some of us have picked up the wrong cross, not the cross of Christ, but the cross of worldly desires and have attached ourselves to those things. And what you desire, we see in your behaviors. We see in your behavior. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, you will know them by their fruits. I'm not your judge in a way that I can tell whether you're going to heaven or hell. But I can judge your fruits. I'm a fruit inspector. And so when you're missing church and you're not sick, or you have to work or some other special reason for your absence, your desires, we see them as misplaced and you have forsaken the assembling of God's people according to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25. When you take your tithe and spend it on something else, you have not only robbed God according to Malachi 3.8, but you have shown your desires to be in the wrong place. When you step down from serving the Lord in one capacity and instead of finding a new place to serve, you take your time that you have dedicated to the Lord back and you apply it to some worldly temporal pursuit. You have put your hands to the gospel plow and looked back, making yourself unfit for the kingdom of God according to Luke 9, 16, uh, 9, 62. Your desires, we've seen them to be misplaced. When you habitually sin, you have failed to deny ungodliness and worldly lust according to Titus 2, 12, and you have shown where your true desires, you have shown the cross that you've attached yourself, and it's not the cross of Christ. But these individuals, they addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They attached themselves. They appointed themselves. They committed themselves to doing service to God. And Paul says to us, look at their example. In verses 15, 16, and 17. He says that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. He says, take their example and follow that. Submit yourself to this. To people that are working and doing God's will, get alongside and work with them. Maybe their example will rub off on you. Maybe you'll learn something by following an old saint of God like Libby Rogers. Maybe you'll learn how to be faithful in all these areas if you would, instead of giving your time to games and and TV and, and all these empty pursuits and apply it to seeking God with your whole heart. I know this is tough medicine and I'm not pointing fingers because if I point fingers, I got three of them pointing back at me and I got a hitchhiker's thumb so they're my thumb's pointing back at me too. We all face this dilemma in our life where the world will say, hey, here's a pursuit, look at this, chase after this, and will try to get us off the race of life, the path that God has set out before us, and will constantly, the world will vie for our attention and distract us. But we have to be committed in everything that we do to seek God with our free will. To do everything to glory to the glory of God and to do everything in charity, in love and free will towards the Lord. And sometimes that means that we've got to put ourselves in a position where we 
learn from others in verse 16. And we get beside of them and work along with them. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, look at verses 17 and 18. Paul says, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. Now that, that's a little bit of a burn from Paul. This church at Corinth, as I've said, they've had a lot of issues. They've had, they've had, they've had a lot of issues, and one of them is that they were not a giving church. They were not a church that was known for praying for people outside of their congregation. They was all about themselves. And so he says, where I have been ministering out here on the mission field, planting churches, seeing people save different things of that nature, and I was expecting you to help me, you lacked. You sent half of what you're supposed to send. You sent a third, whatever that was. They lacked, and these other people that I'm using as examples of what to do, they made up the lack. That's a burn from Paul. He's good at that. But in verse 18 he says, For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, and therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. He says, They have refreshed my spirit and yours. They came not only to Paul's rescue and helped him serve, but they also went and helped others serve. And as he said to them in verse, verse 16, submit yourselves to them and work with them. They may be outsiders, but they're doing the work that you're not doing. So submit yourself and get to work with them. Because they have refreshed spirits. They have refreshed us. Are you committed to the ministry of the saints? Are you addicted to... Ministry of the Saints. Uh, how many of you back in the 90s can remember Carmen? Not Carmen San Diego. Um, Carmen, that's, that, I can't, his last name was Italian, but he's, he was a contemporary singer. And he took every style. He would take Southern Gospel or he'd do contemporary or he'd do rap. And he did every style and he just kind of made songs like that. And he had a song that he entitled Addicted to Jesus. I remember that song. I, we listened to that uh, as a kid all the time. And it simply was about commitment. If you were to look at your behavior, a list of it, would it match up with somebody who is committed to God or committed to self? You say, well, I don't really know where to serve. I haven't really been able to commit myself to an area in the church or an, that God has led me to. Let me give you some direction here. We don't know exactly what this house of Stephanus did, but they came up alongside of Paul and eventually this church at Corinth. We even talked about it a little bit this morning in our Sunday school class of between a general calling, everybody's called to salvation, but not everybody is called to the same ministry. There is the ministry of the word we talk about, and that is the preaching, that is the singing, that is the teaching of God's word. And that's mostly when we come to worship, that's what we see, is we see the ministry of the Word. We're, we're sharing the Word of God in song. We're sharing the Word of God in our prayers. We're sharing the Word of God in our Sunday school lessons. We're sharing the Word of God as we preach. But what we come and enjoy on Sunday mornings, evenings, and Wednesday evenings with the ministry of the Word of God, and though it is the foundation of everything else that we do, it is not all that takes place here. We shared about how our trustees and Sunday school superintendent, they had to take a trip. Not on the good old gospel ship, but they got in Jim's truck and took the trailer and went and picked up a lawnmower. Why? Because there's grass mowing. There's things like that that have to happen around here. And so there is the ministry of the word, but there is, as it says here, the ministry of the saints. And it's a lot more than grass mowing. It's visiting one another. It's helping one another in times of need. It is encouraging one another with the Word. The Bible ta ta teaches us in Ephesians 4, Romans 12, and 1 Corinthians 12 that every believer is a minister to the body of Christ. 
Maybe not a minister in the fact that you're a preaching or, or standing before a congregation or a classroom, but you are a minister to the body of Christ and that you have something to do in the church. That might be a gift of hospitality. Or maybe you have a gift of healing. Whatever it might be, these are gifts and these are things that are given to every man as the Spirit gives them out to the building of the body, to the edification of the church. And so he looks here and says to Stephanus, we don't know for Trinus and Achaicus. We don't know if, we don't think that they had much of a preaching ministry, or at least here we're not told, but they simply came up alongside and served. They were a support for other people. Maybe that's what God's calling you to do. But whatever it is, maybe God's called you to be, be custodian, or God has called you to be an assistant teacher, or God has called you to be a grass mower, or God has called you to oversee the nursing home or homeless feeding ministries, or God has called you to do these things. He's simply saying, will you be committed to do these things? Or will you begin to shift your desires toward things outside the church? toward the world, such as the church of Corinth did. Second Corinthians, Paul in a second letter says in chapter 3, verse 3, he says, For as much as ye have manifestly declared to the epistle of Christ, written, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. He says there basically... We have ministered to you in the Word. But you have, been, you have become an epistle or a letter not written with ink, but in your hearts and in your behaviors of God's work in your life. Your behavior, your service to God is a testimony of what God has done in your life. of what God has called you to be. So it's more than just saying, I'm a Christian. That's an easy testimony to say, right? It's another thing to leave here on Sunday morning after this service, step outside of these grounds and begin to serve God in other places. It's another thing to say, oh, oh, Jim, I love you, bud. But when Jim has a prayer request or when Jim has a need that I turn my back on him. That is not things concerning the ministry of the saints. That will show our desires every time. Whether we are for God and his glory and doing all things in charity or whether we have attached ourselves to other things. So where's your desire today? Where are you serving? And why are you serving? Why are you serving? I've heard it said sometimes, I think I'm going to go and do this ministry because, because I'm hurting. I think it'll, it'll, it'll minister to me too. And I'm not going to say that that is completely wrong. But if that's your, if that's your starting ground, then yeah. Yeah, the ministry's going to fail and you're going to, you're going to suffer in it. Because we are to do first everything to the glory of God. And that should be our chiefest concern is that we worship Him and seek His glory. That is the chief concern of man. Then we begin to look at how we can do things in love. Free will toward others then we can begin to look at ourselves and say, where am I strengthening my faith from this? So again, what are you doing for God? What are you doing for God? What has He called you to that you're not being faithful to right now? What has He called you to do and you've not answered the call? And if you are answering the call, why are you doing it? 
Is it because of the glory of God? Or is there selfish ambition? Is there some other motive for why you're serving the Lord? As we stand this morning, Matt, would you come? Sam, would you come? The ministry of the saints. I'm, 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 I'm not trying, trying to be mean, but even with the ladies' retreat, why are you going on the retreat? Is it simply because you need the vacation? Or you just want to get along with the girls? Or are you doing this first? I'm not saying that those are horrible things or that they're sin or anything, but I'm saying are the priorities misplaced? Is it first off to seek God's glory in your lives? And if it's not, you come and pray again. God's glory must be first. And when we do things, we must do it in charity, love, and free will. Freely giving to the Lord. Freely giving ourselves to the service where He leads us, we do. Because we love Him. And we've chosen to follow Him. What's your choice this morning? Are you choosing to seek His calling? Answer it. Or are you going to stay where you're at as they sing bow your heads with me Father take this word and apply it to our lives that we can grow from it challenge our hearts